Welcome to TNI Jerusalem Calling, your source for unfiltered Mideast talk radio. I'm your host today, Helena Cobbins. I'm the Executive Director of the Council for the National Interest, CNI, and this show is a project of the CNI Foundation, which works for fair U.S. policies in the Middle East and fair discussion of those policies here in America. Find out more about CNI at our website, www.cnionline.org, or on our new blog, Fair Policy, Fair Discussion. Our guest today is Stephen Waltz co-author of the great 2007 book, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy. Also with me in the studio today is Jean Bird, president of the Council for the National Interest. We'll be talking about the uniquely intimate nature of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, and I'll also be asking Steve his assessment of what's been going on inside President Obama's team that has made his Israeli-Palestinian diplomacy so disappointing to so many of us at this point. So, first of all, the uniquely intimate nature of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, Steve, this is something you've written a lot about. How do you assess Israel's influence inside the U.S. Congress these days? The bad news there is that the situation within Congress really hasn't changed very much. Two days ago, for example, the House of Representatives passed some legislation imposing stiffer sanctions on Iran, which was essentially motivated primarily by familiar pro-Israel groups like AIPAC. And I think it passed uh, by a vote of something like 412 in favor and 12 against, with four members voting present. The behavior of Congress so far hasn't changed very much. The overall relationship between the United States and Israel Israel, I think, hasn't changed either substantially. It's a special relationship that really is not like any other relationship we have with any other country in the world. Not only do we continue to subsidize it to the tune of three to four billion a year, but really more importantly, we give it nearly unconditional diplomatic cover, and it is virtually immune from criticism by uh, any American officials. And that's really not a healthy situation because no country behavior is perfect, and no country and it has identical interests with that of the United States. And we ought to be able to talk openly and honestly about this so that we can advance American interests first and foremost, and so we can give Israel constructive advice when we think they're doing things that are unwise. That's the kind of friends don't let friends drive drunk argument, which is one that I've been making for a long time. About that Iran sanctions bill that got passed this week, I gather that a lot of the opposition figures and leaders inside Iran itself were, were pretty strongly opposed to that bill. So what's going on there? I mean, if people want to support the opposition inside Iran, why are they voting for this bill? I think this is, as much as anything else, a sort of act of political symbolism. There are people in the United States who really do believe that confronting Iran uh, with stiffer sanctions uh, is likely to change its nuclear program, despite the fact that we've imposed sanctions on Iran for years without altering its behavior at all. That's simply not going to work. And of course, it actually strengthens the position of hardliners in Iran. It doesn't really do anything uh, to weaken them substantially. So it becomes a kind of symbolic act by which members of Congress can demonstrate how pro-Israel and anti-Iran they are without recognizing that the diplomatic consequences are actually quite counterproductive, both for ordinary Iranians, who might be unhappy with the current government, but also for our broader diplomatic effort to get international support for a tougher multilateral approach. Uh, doing things like this, the legislation actually will penalize foreign companies if they have any engagement with Iran's petroleum industry. Things like that actually make it harder for the United States to get the kind of support we might need from countries like China and Russia to, to really contain Iran more effectively. So do you think the pro-Israel lobbies in this country have a kind of a near lock on Congress? It goes up and down a little bit. I saw with the Gaza war, they got quite a lot of support there. But with the Goldstone report, APAC and the other lobbies got a little bit less support. And now it seems they've kind of upped the number of votes that they can count on once again. Is yeah. other kind of uh, trend significant? It's somewhat sensitive to the issue, as you suggested. Certainly, there have been a couple of moments when Israel was acting in a particularly obvious or, or brutal fashion that you see some of the reflexive support diminish a little bit. But by and large, I think it's the part of the U.S. government where the impact of the lobby is greatest on Capitol Hill. And it's not because, of course, most congressmen are deeply committed here. A few of them are, but it's mostly because most congressmen who don't care one way or the other 
bother all that much about the issue, understand that going along with what some of the hardline groups like APAC and others want keeps them out of trouble. They won't get any criticism at home in their own districts. They won't face the danger of an externally funded candidate suddenly challenging them. And bucking APAC or bucking other groups in the lobby doesn't win them a lot of additional friends. There's no countervailing lobby of equal power on the other side that they can suddenly turn to for support. So unfortunately, the smart political thing for a lot of congressmen is to just do uh, what APAC wants, even on issues like the Goldstone Report, where Congress voted overwhelmingly to condemn it, in which was just a symbolic action. But my guess is that no more than a handful of congressmen had actually ever read the Goldstone Report. I think their staff probably didn't read it. It was just a smart political thing to do, so they went along. So you really didn't listen to Judge Goldstone, who is, in my book, a really inspirational, transformational figure. He played such an important role in the transformation of white thinking in South Africa that paved the way for the democracy movement in, in South Africa. And you know, then he was the chief prosecutor for the International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. I mean, I interviewed him a number of times in the 1990s. And here's a, a guy who is truly trying to figure out how to apply international law in an effective and even-handed way, and they just trashed him without even listening to him. I, I thought it was pretty uh, shameful. <laughs> I agree completely. Judge Goldstone is a very respected international jurist. He's also a uh, committed Zionist, and he made it very clear. He thinks Israel should be treated as a normal country. It should not be exempt from international law, nor should it be treated differently than other countries in the context of international law. And if you read uh, his report and you read the various conditions that he insisted upon before he agreed to take the assignment, he went to enormous lengths to be as fair-minded and even-handed uh, as possible, despite the fact, by the way, that he got essentially no co cooperation whatsoever from the Israeli government. Moreover, it's important to notice that he has made it clear that his report is not in itself an indictment. It is a listing of their findings, and it comes with the recommendation that Israel and the Palestinians, and in particular Hamas, both conduct independent, credible investigations of possible misconduct. That's what international law calls upon them to do. It's a damning body of evidence, carefully compiled, but the idea that he did this out of some sense of bias or irresponsibility, uh, I think is just ludicrous. Again, it's one of those things that people need to sit down and read before they judge it. I'm afraid it's one of those cases where Congress does not acquit itself in a particularly honorable fashion uh, <laughs> when, it, uh, when it does even symbolic things like that. I guess the next question is what we can do to... Uh build some kind of a national movement in this country that can counter that pressure from APAC. And I will be coming back to CNI President Jean Bird on that point. Chief, um, how about the tax deductibility issue and some of these extremely pro-settler organizations in this country? That seems to me something that we could really do something to organize around. That would certainly be the right thing to do. The issue here is the fact that through a variety of mechanisms, it's possible for Americans to give money to various charitable organizations and deduct it on their taxes, even when some of the activities funded by those charities turn out to be essentially illegal and contrary to the stated uh, American policy. We were just getting on to one question, which is what can we do about building some kind of a movement that can counter the strong influence from the pro-Israel lobbies in this country. Jean Bird, do you have some ideas? Well, what, what I'd like, like to ask, Stephen, is what, what impact has your book had? You've made speeches on three continents and sold over 100,000 copies of the what, what impact, impact has the book had, book had on bringing the new, new alternative Jewish and Christian Zionist lobbies into existence here in Washington and across, uh, across America. I'm a little reluctant to try and claim credit for any of this. Others perhaps are better uh, or more objective judges of the impact we've had. But I think the book, along with a number of other things, did help to break a taboo that had grown up about even discussing the subject, that this was one of these issues, the impact of the lobby on U.S. Middle East policy that lots of people understood and were aware of and would talk about privately, but no one really wanted to talk about it openly, uh, and certainly not in a critical fashion and 
and not inside the beltway. And we wrote our book primarily to break that taboo. And I think you've seen a lot of movement in the last couple of years where suddenly discussions of the lobby are in places like the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine. John Stewart has done several segments on his, on the Daily Show about it. There have been panels at academic conferences, symposiums in a number of different journals and magazines. There's a wonderful film by an Israeli filmmaker called Defamation by uh, Yoav Shamir that deals with this as well. And so I think you are seeing the discourse about this subject begin to change. The other thing that's happened, and again, I don't know to what extent we're really responsible for it, is the emergence of groups like J Street and other more progressive American Jewish organizations who have been trying to form an alternative to the traditional status quo lobby uh, and try and get the power of the American government uh, directed towards peace rather than maintaining that status quo. I have heard indirectly that our book was part of the inspiration for that, but I have no direct evidence that that was in fact the case. I think, you know, again, a more open discourse, more frank and candid conversation about what's really happening there, and the emergence of some alternative political groups to push a smarter agenda is terrific news. But the lobby is a powerful set of organizations, and it's not going to change overnight. I've certainly noticed in my long career in journalism that it was only in the past few years that very common journalistic practices, like journalists taking freebie trips to Israel thanks to the American Israel Education Foundation or other pro-Israeli funding organizations. That was never discussed, and it was a very widespread practice. Now it's much more common that when a, a journalist goes to Israel on one of these freebie trips, he comes back or she comes back and starts talking about all the wonderful things they've seen, and other journalists and people will say, well, who funded your trip? Which is the kind of scrutiny that everybody should be subject to wherever they travel. Yeah, I think that's always the, the, used to be assumed that that was okay. Nobody would talk about it. I think that's exactly right. I think there are two other things going on here. First is just events in the region. During the 1990s, when the Oslo peace process was going on, people could fool themselves into believing that you know peace was almost at hand. We were about to put this problem to rest forever. And when Oslo broke down and the fighting began again, more and more people began to look at this. Then you follow that with 9-11, which certainly woke up many Americans to realizing that our position in the Middle East, many of our policies were counterproductive. Follow that with the Iraq War, where I think the the lobby, and in particular the neo conservatives played obviously a key role in bringing that about. And then add to that the uh, war in Lebanon and then the fighting in Gaza last year. That set of events began to reveal to many Americans that there was something going on here and that Israel was not a blameless victim in all of this. American policy was messed up, but also Israeli policy in many respects was messed up. And I want to add one other point, and that's the emergence of the Internet as an alternative information source. I think both as a way for people to mobilize, but also as a way of simply getting information out in the form of you know, videos and other forms of coverage has had a huge impact in shaping how people see this problem now. I think that's definitely the case. And in the lead up to the Iraq war, which, as you pointed out in the book and pointed out just now, you know, was a major project, if you like, of the neoconservative wing of the pro-Israel lobby, in, in the lead up to the war, Many of us were reading the media from Britain rather than the media from here because the Washington Post and the New York Times were just beating the drums for war, their coverage, their editorial, just about everything. It was very hard to get the hard questions raised. Helena, can I bring in at this point and ask Steve about the spread of his book across the world because I'm very much impressed. There have been earlier books, such as the Rabbi Elmer book in the early 50s, and, of course, Paul Kennedy's book, There to Be Out. Incidentally, Paul is coming out with a new memoir, which we're looking forward to next year. But your book was unique in that it was immediately adopted or became famous in Europe and in the Middle East. Can you tell us a little bit about your appearances out there? 
The book has now been published in about 24 different countries, translated into, I think, 22 different languages. One interesting thing is that the reception outside the United States was almost always more positive than it was here. Uh, we got consistently positive reviews in England, uh, in most European countries, some critical ones in parts of Europe. We actually got four positive reviews in Israel itself, including a very long and positive review in uh, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. We spoke throughout Europe, and in each case, very live discussions, uh, good reception. We spoke in several uh, Arab countries and also in Israel itself in the summer of 2008, where again we had a, a really a wonderful time, very good, candid uh, discussions with some people being critical, some people being very supportive. I think that all of that conveys that this is a topic that is much easier to talk about outside the United States. Again, largely because there has been this very powerful taboo against it and because people understood that raising the subject was likely to get you smeared as being an anti-Semite, politically marginalized in one way or another. We just think this is not healthy, that American Middle East policy is very important to the country, and in order to have an intelligent policy, you have to be able to talk about it openly and honestly and raise lots of issues, even if some people are uncomfortable with them. The more we can encourage that to happen, the better off we're going to be, but the better off our friends in the region, including Israel, are going to be. Yeah, I think an important part of that is being able to point out where our national interests diverge from those of Israel's. And, of course, in the peacemaking, Clinton and George W. Bush always said things like, well, we can't want peace more than the parties themselves. I think that's quite wrong. We can. As Americans, we can want peace more than the parties themselves because they may be locked into some kind of dysfunctional relationship. But it's a very strong U.S. interest that this issue get resolved and that a sustainable peace be secured, and, and we should be quite forthright in saying that. It's also a little bit disingenuous. People sometimes say that as if implying the United States uh, should take a more hands-off view. This was the theme of a recent column by Tom Friedman in the New York Times. The, the two parties can't solve this. We should disengage and wait till they're serious. But, of course, we're not able to take a neutral position as long as the United States continues to give Israel enormous amounts of economic, military, and diplomatic support. If somebody wanted to talk about true disengagement, one could discuss that, but the point is we are very closely associated with Israel and its security. We are therefore implicated in the occupation. We are not surprisingly blamed for Israel's excesses, and therefore it is a vital American interest. Gloria from Akron, are you there? My question is, we're all disappointed that it seems that Obama is backing down on the two-state solution or even talking about it. I'm just wondering if they have any idea whether they think that perhaps he you knows it has to be done in the second term. There's no way he can do it in the first term. What direct uh, contact do uh, people like uh, Steve Waltz have? And, and are, are they getting the ear of the president and his cabinet? Also, I hear the conditions in Gaza are just terrible. I had suggested a while back before the Gaza war that maybe we could organize a sort of Berlin airlift into Gaza perhaps get a Norwegian or Swedish flyer to do this and call it Berlin Gaza. Would they dare shoot down the planes? Also, I have been reading a George Bull's President Attach Passionate Attachment. I was just wondering what they thought of that book. I have given many, many presentations about this and I get a very good reception from most people. They're very concerned. First of all, I have a lot of sympathy for President Obama in the sense that I think he gets the situation in the Middle East, but he came into office inheriting a floundering economy, sort of teetering on the brink of a disaster, two losing wars, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, plus a whole series of other problems. I think he has the right instincts here, but like our caller, I have been disappointed by the follow-through. I think he started off quite well, making the quite reasonable declaration to the Israelis that they should stop settlement construction uh, and that he was going to get very serious about pushing for two states for two peoples. He gave a terrific speech in in Cairo. And then, unfortunately, when the Israeli government dug in its heels and made it clear that it was going to continue settlement expansion, and that even though they've announced a temporary halt, in fact, it's going to continue, uh, certainly in Jerusalem, but also within the existing settlements that run uh, all through the West Bank. At that point, the Obama administration simply caved. Now, I don't know exactly why they did that. They've actually been, uh, there's been very little public information about the sort of 
process by which they made that decision. My own view is that they decided they simply could not, given all the other things that Obama was trying to accomplish, like the health care plan, they could not afford to take on uh, the, the various organizations in the lobby that would cost them enough votes in Congress on other issues. Uh, they decided they simply couldn't push it. And so my great fear is that the Obama administration will end up being like uh, most recent administrations that occasionally says the right things, but never summons the political will to use American power and influence to finally bring about a two-state solution. This, I might add, is a tragedy in the making. It's not good for us, but it's a tragedy for both the Palestinians and the Israelis, because if you don't get a two-state solution, the future for those two peoples looks quite bleak in the foreseeable future. I think I'll stop there. There were some other good good questions in there about, about Gaza. Well, you've answered the questions uh, very well. Recently, I had a chance to listen to Glenn Kessler and a few others concerning the problem of whether or not Obama had a doctrine for the Middle East. Everybody, almost every president has had a doctrine for the Middle East. And they decided at this seminar the other day here in Washington, no, there wasn't a doctrine, but that it was sort of pragmatic realism or realistic pragmatism that drives the president and drives the White House. On the other hand, people who are very close to the White House, but outside it, told me the other night, it's such a mess. It's a mess out in the Middle East. The Israelis don't know what they want and what they are going to do with regard to Iran and Gaza and so on. And it's a mess back here in Washington. That doesn't bode well for the immediate future. I'm afraid that's right. We have a deeply divided Palestinian community. We have a very fragile coalition in the Israeli government, one in which Prime Minister Netanyahu is one of the more moderate members of his cabinet and a society that is probably uh, incapable of making the kind of concessions it would need to make. We have lots of other problems in surrounding countries and an American president who, again, I think understands what needs to be done but is not feeling uh, politically able to do so. He's not willing to make this one of his top two or three priorities. They started off well, but they had not thought about what Plan B was going to be if their initial set of initiatives were stymied. And that's, in fact, exactly what happened, and it put the administration sort of back on its heels, unable to, to make another move. I mean, we'll hope for, for better in the next year. I do find it somewhat hard to be optimistic at this point. One thing about the immediate future George Mitchell is trying hard, but he is faced by an Israeli government that is trying to get rid of Hamas and trying to take out the Iranian nuclear sites if that is required. One of the points that might come up in the immediate future, a decision that the administration might have to make in the first quarter of this next year, is if the Israelis decide to hit the sites because the Iranian sanctions aren't working or they aren't applied by everyone. Will the United States offer Israeli pilots a chance to land and refuel in Iraq? I don't know whether this is the right John, scenario. Good question. Or not. Thank you. Um, Steve, maybe you could uh, address yourself to that quickly. I think the United States is dead set against any military action against Iran and it would certainly not provide any active assistance to the Israelis if they were planning it. Uh, there's always a question about whether or not the Israelis are serious about doing something like this or whether they're posturing to try and push the Iranians to compromise by threatening something like this. But I think the American military and the Obama administration, at least for the moment, understands that military action against Iran now would be quite counterproductive to our other commitments in the region. And I think we will tr try very hard to make sure Israel doesn't do anything like that anytime soon. I personally think it's not the way to try and address the Iranian problem at all that uh, having uh, the threat of force on the table is one of the things that convinces Iran that it maybe wants to get a nuclear weapon, and we're not going to dissuade them from going that route unless we try a very different approach than even the Obama administration has taken up until now. Do you have any idea what that approach might be, Steve? I think you have to take the threat of military force and regime change off the table. That may happen down the road, but that will happen as a result of actions taken by the Iranian people, not by things that we do from outside. You have to make it clear to the current government or any future Iranian government that we're not interested in overthrowing them, we're not interested in attacking them, and that they, in fact, would be better off themselves not going all the way to getting a nuclear weapon. We do 
do have John on the line. My experience has been that because the power of APAC and the influence of pro-Israeli powers that be within the media, that organizing to counter what they're doing is extremely, extremely difficult. So that the kind of the normal kinds of organizing haven't been terribly effective so far. I'm kind of hoping to get people to think outside the box and think about how to get the numbers up possibly to go to religious leaders, although I think that's going to be a difficult thing to do because religious leaders don't like to get too mixed up in politics. I don't see any other way to get the numbers up to the level where we'll actually have an impact on the debate and turn the tide on the Middle East policy debate. That's part of what we're trying to do here at CNI these days with this radio show, which is an Internet-based radio show, and with our blog, Fair Policy, Fair Discussion. And this is part of what Steve Walt was talking about a little earlier when he said that the mainstream media, the big media corporations, no longer have a kind of a lock hole on the public discourse. But Gene Bird, do you have any comments about that? This is a 20-year-old organization, and I must say we look back and say, well, what have we done? Well, perhaps we haven't accomplished nearly as much as we set out to do, which was to somehow curb the lobby and to do that, we would have to curb the amount of money is flowing to Israel without any adequate monitoring. We give, or used to give, $1 billion in economic aid to Israel, and we got a one-page letter back every year as to what they did with it. That's not really monitoring. I think one of the things that needs to be done is to go back to the Eisenhower formula, which was to threaten Israel with a review of the 501c3 status of some of the Jewish organizations that are supporting the neo-colonists, as uh, we're now calling the settlers, the neo-colonists on the West Bank, until you cut off or threaten to cut off some part of aid to Israel. And uh, it has to be done probably by the, in a presidential way, which is possible under the 501c3 formula, you are not going to get anywhere. There's about $1 billion a year going to Israel under the 501c3, and we ought to be taking a look at what oh, that money is and being of course, used uh, for. Yeah. We as taxpayers are all uh, subsidizing that in terms of those tax revenues foregone. Yes, it's, um, it's a 30 or 40 Steve, percent. Steve, uh, I, I, I'd like to bring this back to Steve Walt um, just for a moment. Do you see any organizations in this country that are really working on these issues effectively? And how can we build up something? I mean, you mentioned J Street. Um, there's Churches for Middle East Peace. There's Americans for Peace Now. There is our little organization, Council for the National Interest. But do you have any great suggestions? This may have to be your last question, sadly, yeah, okay. um, as, as to how we can be more effective. First of all, there's always been activity in American mainstream Christian churches who've cared about peace in the Middle East and sort of don't take sides one way or the other. They just are opposed to the conflict. There have been organizations within the American Jewish community, including the rabbinical community, groups like Brit Sedek Vishalom, that has recently essentially formed a partnership, I believe, with J Street, and as you mentioned, groups like Americans for Peace Now. I think the critical thing is sort of two steps. First, there has to be a change of consciousness within significant segments of the American Jewish community, the people who have been supporting groups like APAC in the past, believing that those groups were advocating policies that were good for uh, the United States and good for Israel. In fact, those, the policies those groups have supported have been bad for both countries, and it's the recognition that Israel may be driving itself off a cliff that I think has led to the emergence of more progressive organizations. The second step is, of course, for those groups to then form an alliance with other like-minded organizations organizations, whether, you know, Jewish or Gentile, who also believe in advancing U.S. interests, not to harm other countries, and certainly not to harm Israel, but rather because peace and a two-state solution is the only thing that can safeguard Israel's long-term future. You sort of want people to have a change of consciousness within some of the traditionally uh, pro-Israel groups. You want to see alliances formed between those groups and more progressive organizations, and then also reaching out to other groups who are more focused on on traditional American foreign policy. This is going to involve both grassroots work and a lot of getting out and arguing and engaging in good political contestation. It won't happen quickly, but I do think it will happen over time. Just one quick question from Claire. 
Professor Walt, I yes. interviewed you in um, September of 2007, and I pressed you and, and Professor Mearsheimer about a two-state versus one-state solution. Have you changed your mind? No, I still think that a two-state solution is preferable to a one-state solution because I think the practical obstacles to one state are really daunting. That said, I am increasingly struck by the fact that time is really running out. It may even have run out on a two-state solution. Very few people have thought about what American or Israeli or Palestinian policy is going to be once it becomes clear that two is simply not possible. And we ought to be starting to think about that because if we continue on our present course, that's precisely where we're going to end up. I think we've been thinking about it quite a lot at CNI, whether we should carry on being wedded to the two-state out idea or look at the one-state idea. Um, I know in the past when I was working with the Quakers, we said that obviously the human rights of all people, Palestinians and Israelis, have to be given equal regard. And that could happen within the two-state framework or it could happen within a one-state framework. Ignoring and denying the rights of one group is not the way to go forward. Listen, I'm afraid our time has run out here. Um, I want to thank Professor Stephen Walt and Mr. Jean Bird for being with us today on CNI Jerusalem Calling. It was really a pleasure and a privilege to have both of you on our discussion here. And thank you for the callers. Both of you on our discussion here. And thank you for the callers. Both of you on our discussion.